as I was walking down 111th Street this past week, lying on the street side in the gutters, leaning against fire hydrants and stoops, were Christmas tree after Christmas tree, all sizes, some with tinsel still hanging from its boughs, others with needles dry and brittle branches. And I found my attention drawn to them all. And I felt a twinge of sadness within me. Christmas has come and gone for another year. And it all happens so fast, doesn't it? And every year I make the same promise to myself that I'm going to slow down for Advent and Christmas and truly take in this beautiful season of expectation and and celebration. And every year, my well-meaning promise discovers that it shares space with the reality of a busy New York resident. And ever so easily, it begins to lose ground to my pressurized enforcement of Christmas appreciation. I have to confess, after the decorations have come down and the poinsettias put out to pasture, ours will be today, and the Christmas carols have faded into silence when I'm exhausted once again by my own high expectations. When all of that is acknowledged, I can, for the time being, for a moment, experience the gratitude of right what's in front of me. And then suddenly I'm caught off guard. It's over already? Oh, I, of course I know that there is the liturgical season of Christmas, which lasts for 12 days today, being the 12th day. And I know that there is more to the story. We all know that. The celebration of Jesus' birth is just the beginning. It's too soon to pack away the meaning of Christmas, of God breaking into the world. Too soon to pack all of that away with the boxes of decorations. But still. In his poem, For the Time Being, W.H. Auden describes his post-Christmas experience. And he writes, Well, so that is that. We've gotten through Christmas once again, perhaps in spite of ourselves. But it's over now. Once again, as in previous years, we have seen the actual vision and failed to do more than entertain it as an agreeable possibility. So it's back to the old world we left behind for just a bit on Christmas Eve, and perhaps that makes us weary. And yet the vision will not entirely go away. We almost wish it would. Auden then concludes, to those who have seen the child, however dimly, however incredulously, the time being is, in a sense, the most trying time of all. The time being, as Auden describes, is now, full of contradiction. It is more than just the post-Christmas blue. Auden is talking about a process difficult to detect, those forces that creep back in and deaden our spirits. No, I think it's, it's much more than the gray, wet winter days and long winter nights that we are experiencing that is affecting uh, me, uh, if not you. It, it, it's a spiritual longing that will not go away. It is the longing of the wise men who follow the star whose desire will not easily fade. 
And we are the Magi. And we still remember, somewhere buried deep within our souls, that same longing for the star that lights our way to the divine. Who were these Magi? Where did they come from? Where do they emerge in our own souls? We're told that they came from the east, following a star, and landed in Jerusalem asking questions. And their longing comes from someplace unknown, from another side, different, like a breath of fresh air, bringing new gifts, new perspective. It stirs us up. And imagine the stir they caused amongst the hometown folk. When outsiders from another country show up asking where to find the child born king of the Jews, needless to say, the authorities were alarmed. King Herod, as we heard in our gospel today, is so unnerved that he meets with his chief priests and scribes and then putting on his most Machiavellian hat, calls a secret meeting with these foreigners. Go and search diligently for the child, he says, and when you have found him, bring me word so that I may also go and pay him homage. But you know what he really, really cares about. It's a wonder question that captures our imaginations. It's the inspiration for great masterpieces in art and in music and poetry. But I wonder, is it possible that because we've heard this story so often that it's lost its original intention? Only Matthew of the four gospel writers tells of the wondrous story of the wise men and the birth of Jesus. And some scholars note that Matthew was telling it for new Christians or new believers, new followers of the way, because Matthew had become concerned that this young community of believers was limiting their vision. The boundaries of their community were being built. These first believers, Matthew felt, were too easily settling in with the deadening attitude that this new life was meant only for them. That light shining into the world was only theirs. There was an exclusionist mentality that Matthew intended to address in his recounting of the nativity story. And it begins with the very first verse of his gospel. Matthew's genealogy breaks from the tradition of tracing it through the male lineage to include four women in his list of Jesus' ancestors. And these were not four women from the finest families. They were women whose lives were impacted by incest and prostitution exclusion and shunning, adultery and murder. There was Tamar and Rabab and Ruth and the wife of Uriah, whose name Bathsheba couldn't even be written or spoken. Matthew was tearing down the walls of this closed community by welcoming this lineage into the bloodstream. Something new was dawning, different from what anyone else might have perceived or expected. And then we have these visitors from other countries, magi, wise men. Scholars have suggested that perhaps they were philosophers or because of their fascination with the stars, astrologers. Some say they were mystics, sorcerers, strange and deeply intuitive people. Searchers, not afraid of their own longings. 
Why else would they have responded to a star? Why else would they have embarked upon this journey into the unknown? They must have been in touch with their deepest longings. Otherwise, they would never have left the comfort of their own home. Traditionally, the warm communion we've come to feel from this story was not felt by Matthew's community. They were scandalized. How dare these strangers appear in their hometown to worship and adore their newborn king? But Matthew does not let up. He tells the rest of the story of Jesus with the same perspective. The saving word of God, the death and resurrection of Jesus the Christ, not for some, but for all. Not for men only, but for women and for children. Not for those that look like or dress like or act like us, but for those with whom we'd rather disassociate from. Not for those from whom our own hometown or country they come from, but for those who live across the desert lands and the oceans. Not for those who believe just like we do, but for all those whose faith journeys have taken them other places or no place at all. But the Herod energy, with its disbelief, and its fear wants to kill off the wonder and power of God breaking into our world and into ourselves. It's very, very much alive today. It is what I struggle against when I see the Christmas trees lying in the gutters. It's what tempts me to despair when I hear reports of the recent anti-Semitic violence or think about the possibility of a new war in the Middle East. It's what dulls my senses as I slip into hopelessness that my children are witnessing the shameful degradation of our planet by my own generation and that their children will suffer for it. But the story of these mystics, the wise men, arise me from my stupor. They remind me that the Christmas story is about the birth of God and the arrival of miracles. It is about the continuing transformation of the world and of ourself by forgiveness, compassion, love. Even in the suffering world, it is our deep longing, our own longing for Christ that the Magi represent, their desire, their longing. It is the continual discovery of the light. That which takes on our flesh does not ignore the darkness, but shines in the very midst of it in the midst of our darkness, in the midst of the chaos of our lives, Jesus arrives, offering a new understanding of God in the world. Emmanuel, God with us. Later, we'll hear Jesus say, I come that you might have life and have it abundantly. He is that word spoken in the midst of our chaos, bringing us the new breath of life, a new way of being. In and through Jesus, we are shown how we are meant to be. That even as God has poured upon us the new light of God's incarnate word, we are to allow this light to shine forth in our lives. And we are being asked to embrace the truth that when the word became flesh, our vision has forever expanded, our hopes and our dreams for justice and peace and compassion and love have been nourished and enlivened by the way in which Jesus embodied the sacred, the one who is the source and ground of our being, that which we call God. The implications are profound. It changes how we see ourselves and one another, how we live and the way we live. 
our actions, our words. It means, it means that Christmas cannot be limited to a one-time event, an anniversary celebrated on a particular time year after year. So on this last day of Christmas, as we move into the season of Epiphany, celebrating the incarnation of God in Jesus. May we remember the good gifts that we have been given, the sun and the moon, the good earth with all of its blessings of sky and water, plants and animals, this incredible gift of life, of flesh and blood, of breath and memory, this day, this moment, and those who share life with us both joy and sorrow, and all that it means for us to be fully human and fully alive and fully present to the divine within. And above all, may we remember the gift of the word made flesh sent to show us who we are, to heal us, to give us peace, and to bring us back to God's own self. 